Welcome everyone. My name is Ian Markham and I am the Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary. It really is my distinct honour to welcome you to this webinar hosted by our Centre for Anglican Communion Studies. Virginia Seminary's Centre for Anglican Communion Studies exists to resource practices of reconciliation. This is done through international partnerships, programmes and publications that equip international community, empower intercultural leadership, and enrich Episcopal Anglican identity. Now, the theme of the Centre's programme this year is the Anglican Communion, a moment for justice. It's entirely appropriate then that the first event in this year's programme is a book talk by Bishop Michael Curry. Bishop Curry is the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church, elected in 2015, He's the first African-American to leave the denomination. A noted advocate for human rights and an author, Bishop Curry is recognized as one of the most popular preachers in the English language. In his new inspirational book, Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times, Bishop Curry offers a roadmap for living the way of love. Through the prism of his faith, ancestry and personal journey, Love is the way shows us how America came this far and how it might fulfill its most life-giving promise for the future. We know Bishop Curry has been hosting talks virtually across the country and we're thrilled that he's made VTS one stop on the tour. Thank you, Bishop Curry. If you don't already have a copy of Love is the Way, you can get a copy through Penguin Random House, a link for purchasing the book will appear on your screen shortly. Today's conversation is taking place as a webinar on Zoom, and it's also being broadcast live on YouTube and shared on Facebook. We will have almost an hour of conversation and we'll be weaving in questions from our audience throughout this time. We encourage participants to submit questions starting now through the Q&A function on Zoom, or in the chat or comments section on YouTube and Facebook. We will try to get to as many as we possibly can. We will end today promptly at 1.45. In addition to introducing Bishop Curry, it's also my pleasure to welcome award-winning journalist, Ray Suarez, a good friend of the seminary. Ray is a renowned international journalist and author, having held leading posts at National Public Radio, PBS, Al Jazeera America, Ray will be leading the discussion today, and I really would like to welcome and thank you, Ray. Great to be with you all. Good to see you, Dean, and a great pleasure to see you, Bishop. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at Love is the Way, do so. Uh, let me add my voice to, uh, to Ian Markham's. Now, of course, because we're living in a time of COVID-19, the cover, uh, the Bishop's keeping it close, now he's got his COVID fro working there and uh, something a little more Stephen Douglas. Uh, 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 yeah, it's the Frederick uh, Douglas. <laughs> Frederick Douglas like uh, a fierce mane now instead of a uh, sort of welcoming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is uh, nice to see you even in this odd circumstance. I've been writing from this room and talking from this room and doing radio and television from this room uh, because of the peculiar times we live in. And now I'm able to talk to the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church from this room. So uh, adding, adding a, a new distinction uh, that not one that I necessarily would have sought, but I'm glad that we're talking now in these days after the election because love is the way is the heart of the Christian message. And yet we are living through days right now, uh, following, capping a bitter divisive election season, but now even at a time when the results are being tabulated, entering a new national argument about what they mean and what they mean to who and who will accept who as their president and on and on and on. It doesn't seem like a very loving moment so I'm glad we're talking right now. Um, why don't we begin with some advice for how to navigate this with friends, with relations, with people at church 
who you suspect might be on the other side of some of these questions. Well, Ray, thank you for doing this and for your kind words and, and for noticing that I still have some hair left because I didn't know I had any left, to be honest. And thank you to Dean Markham um, and, and all of his team and for the Center for Anglican Studies. Thank you all and all who have gathered. Yeah, this, is a, uh, this has been a tough moment, almost a perfect storm um, uh, for, for this country and to some extent for the world. I mean, the pandemic is global. Um, it really is a global pandemic. Um, um, just last week, the primates of the Anglican Communion met with the Archbishop of Canterbury and for two days. And, and part of what we did was listen to each other's stories about the impact of COVID-19. Um, this is a global pandemic. Um, and, and, and for us in the US to actually have almost a disproportionate amount of, of cases and deaths um, just seems unusual um, in that the most developed world with the most developed medical technology available to it has the highest. Um, that just, just that in itself is stunning. Um, but also to think about for those of us, at least in the US, um, this has been a national time of racial reckoning. Um, um, the, the murder of George Floyd kind of, oh, it kind of woke in the uh, hip hop sense. Um, the nation became more woke, if you will, um, to the reality of, of racism and systemic racism and, and even white supremacy and its power in our national history for, for generations. And then you add on top of that, the pre-existing divisions that were there. Um, um, that we saw to some extent in the election of 2016, but they predated that and now have, have reared up in a profoundly uh, problematic way that um, untended to could be injurious to democracy itself. Um, these are tough, this is a perfect storm. And I, you know, I, I do wanna suggest Ray that, and I'm not just saying this as a catchphrase, but the way of unselfish sacrificial love that is committed to seeking the good and the well-being of others as well as the self. That is the only way we are going to extricate ourselves from this nightmare, if you will. Um, the, the way of self-centeredness, the way of selfishness um, is self-destructive in the long run. It may have short-term gain, but it's long-term loss. Um, for everyone. And so that's that's why I really do believe in the message um, that's, that's sort of in this book, um, because I believe our national destiny as a democracy depends on it, and our human destiny as a human community depends on it, and the life of the planet itself. I'm wondering if we wouldn't get an amen in principle, but not in practice. There are a lot of us who would say, oh, yes, you know, I've been a church person my whole life. I've heard the gospel preached my whole life. I went to Sunday school. I heard that Jesus loves me, but also I was told that I had to love my fellow uh, wherever and whoever he or she may be. I got it. I'm good on the grounding there. But that guy, he really just gives me a pain. And the, the closing that gap between principle and practice seems to be particularly difficult right at this moment. When, for instance, a majority of Americans now are telling pollsters that they suspect that white people are the most discriminated against members of society, that it's more difficult to be a white person in America than a black person, um, scoffing at the idea of systemic racism, mm -hmm. uh, doubting that race can hold a person back or change the trajectory of their life in America. Um, sort of doubting that the sky is blue, doubting that the tides <laughs> rise and fall. We are not just at a difficult point in the conversation. We're not even standing on the grounding of the same ground where we can have an argument and maybe come to different conclusions about the same set of facts. We're not even dealing with the same set of facts anymore. Yeah, I, 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 think, there's, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And not a lot, it's obvious there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I think we have to shift the ground, which is to say, we've got to identify where is their common ground and then build from there. 
I'll give, give you an example. When I, and I mentioned this, this is in the book at one point. Um, I was in the Diocese of Utah uh, maybe two years ago. Um, and uh, while I was there, I was there for the Dawson Convention, but while I was there, the bishop made a point to introduce me to a priest um, in the diocese who had been doing work. He also was a therapist, but he had, had been doing work in his community, uh, bringing together people who were self-identified and obviously red and people who were obviously blue. And he brought them together. He had enough street cred, if you will, in the community, had been there long enough that he could actually bring them together and he said, we're not going to come together to debate issues. What we're going to do is to come together to learn your life story, my life story, and someone else's to understand how you came to the position that you've come to. We're not going to debate your position. We want to learn your story. The genius of that is what he was doing was creating common ground. Because the truth is, when we... To, to, to learn each other's story is to actually discover who the other really is. When that happens, you have changed the ground on which we stand um, and made it possible, open the possibility that I might still profoundly disagree with you, but if I understand you a little bit, then maybe I can at least appreciate, maybe respect, and maybe God help us love. And if when that happens, then we have gained the capacity to disagree without being destructive. You see, you see what I'm getting at? And that's, and what he was doing was creating the ground on which love gives us space to stand. Um, and he was doing it. There are groups like Braver Angels, um, which is a national group of folk. Uh, Bishop Mark Beckwith, who's retired from Newark, um, is involved in that work. And they, they've got a national network and they've got programs and designs to do exactly this kind of thing, bring to people together across profound differences. I think, Ray, I think that's the work we have got to do. That is the work of the church and our society. But if the society won't do it first, then the church and religious communities of all faiths and strife, we have got to do that work because when we actually get to know, you know, James Baldwin wrote that book, Nobody Knows My Name which was a way of saying, if you don't know my name, you don't know me, and I am Ralph Ellison's invisible man to you. I am non-existent, and therefore um, I am an it to you as far as you are concerned, a nothing. And that's when unthinkable stuff happens. You see what I mean? That's when hatred and, you see, you can demonize it. It's hard to demonize somebody for most of us, for most normal people, it's hard to demonize somebody I really know well. I, I, I probably should. Well, let me let me push back you on you uh, a little bit. As a reporter, I've traveled to communities around the country where people seem to have very little problem, or at least when they're talking to me, in particularizing the people they know, and generalizing the people they don't. So, for instance, disdaining Mexicans in various places in the country, but knowing that uh, Olga in their office is a hard worker, a lovely person, a church person, someone with First Holy Communion pictures on her desk. Oh, Olga's lovely, but yeah. Mexicans right. do X, Y, Z. I don't want more Muslims in the country. This is a terrible thing. It's bad for the country. It's not my America. But at work, there's an engineer named Farid. Farid's a good guy. He shows up every day on time, works hard. Uh, I know he takes good care of his family. So Farid, I'm not gonna say terrible things about him because I know him, but Muslims, terrible, terrible. And though those, those thoughts should not live easily in mm -hmm. our heads, uh, for a lot of people, that's not a hard, a, not a hard formation to make. Well, I, I mean, I think it is and it isn't. I, I mean, I think you did, right? I mean, that's a reality on the ground. And yet I would submit that most of those people don't know uh, more people than just that one person they've named. You see what I'm getting at? It's, oh, it's sure. a limited, it's a very limited scope. So I can, um, this person contradicts the stereotype I have in my head. Oh, well, they're an exception. 
I mean, black folk have lived with that where oh, <laughs> oh, would compliment you and say, oh, you're so intelligent and articulate. That's a put down. <laughs> it's actually, it's not intended to be, but that's actually- you Oh, I've are been the, there. I've been there, Bishop. <laughs> I know, exactly. So that, um, but the more exposure people have to, to a variety of people, See, one of the things that the motto of this country, e pluribus unum, from many diverse peoples, one people, um, that only works if we experience the fullness of the diversity. If we, uh, that's why segregation doesn't work. Segregation works in contradiction to democracy itself. And I don't mean just racial, but I mean, separating, segregating our diversity where we don't actually know each other. Like Ralph, Ellis, like uh, James Baldwin said, when nobody knows my name, that that's, you can make exceptions to the stereotype, but maintain the stereotype. But when you see I'm exposed to the fullness, it's gonna be hard to maintain that stereotype when I know um, not just uh, Farid, but Mohammed um, and Naomi and, you know, and on and on and on and on. Um, and when I begin, I'll give you an example. Um, I think the LGBTQ folk community have really helped us um, something changed in America when people stopped talking about gay and lesbian folk as it, as an object, or as a, um, an issue. Something changed when um, Ellen came out. And everybody loved Ellen. Be before, and then they had to figure, well, we still love Ellen. You see that something changed when people started realizing there are people in their family who are gay, lesbian, um, transgender. I mean, they said, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah." I, you know, I know Uncle Joe, or Aunt Mary, or whoever it is. I mean, something began to change when we began to realize that there are LGBTQ people all over who we all know. <laughs> you see, when it was just one, you can make an exception and you can pigeonhole them. But when we realize this is part of the diversity of our humanity, when we know each other's names and the LGBTQ community made a point coming out day and those kinds of things where people started to discover, oh, well, I already know LGBTQ folk. I know more and more and it became norm. It became normal. And suddenly the stereotypes didn't work anymore or don't work as profoundly anymore. And slowly but surely as society, we've watched the evolution of American society. I mean, it's not complete, it's not finished, but a lot has changed when we took, when we allowed folk to come out of the closet in secret and become public for who they were, for us to learn their names. And that's a game changer. It really is. And I think that's what the big, it's tough work though. It's, it, it's tough work, but it can be done. It's only 16 years since Massachusetts became the first state in the union uh, to allow same-sex marriage. Yeah. Um, it was a difficult political straddle for John Kerry because that happened to be the same year he was nominated uh, for president and the convention was in his hometown of Boston. Uh, the stars lined up in a difficult way, and the other party um, exploited that opening, believing, and it was still the case in 2004, that most Americans would be against not only same-sex marriage, but civil unions. It is remarkable. It's head-spinning, almost, it is. to think that it's just been 16 years since then, yet that issue has had the power, still has the power, to divide our church to set off family fights and to create difficult situations for us as a denomination and for our denomination in the world community of yeah. Anglicans. And you write about that in the book. Yeah, and it, you know, and the reality is this kind of um, emotional, no, spiritual, it's, it is a spiritual transformation that has to happen over time. Um, and that takes uh, that takes a while. I mean, you, you have to do I mean, I've often said about civil rights and human rights. You have to change laws. You have to change policies and practices. But we've also got to work at changing, transforming hearts. The prophet Jeremiah in Ezekiel talked about this. We must take hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh. 
um, hearts of the spirit. Um, and ultimately, you've got to do both. It's not either or. You've got to do both. You got to change laws. You got to change practices. You got to change behaviors, regulate behaviors. But you've also got to work at the transformation of the heart. I tell you, when Jesus told old Nicodemus, you must be born again, he was telling us stuff not about just getting to heaven. He was talking about how we can live right here on earth, too. We must be born anew to a new self, a new loving self. I mean, and, and that takes work and time and it's not easy. It, it's not easy, but the cost of not doing it, that price is too high. It is too, too much of a price to pay. We've got to do it. And believe it or not, it's partially in the job description of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be church, to be involved in helping America, helping the world, to be born again from the old creation to the new creation. But as a diocesan leader, and as now the leader of our church across the country, you had to take that on, even when there was a risk that there would be losses connected to that. Dioceses that were on the bubble, looking for the exit door, who headed out after these decisions were made, uh, bishops who ended up being disciplined, um, representing your own diocese and voting in convention for changes in the canons, uh, that you had to, had to be ready for the pushback on that. How do you live into that risk when it's real? It's lost membership and lost pledges and lost Sunday attendance and bad blood in the short term there's stuff that has to be lived through that's not easy, even if, if, if it may be right in the long haul. Yeah. You know, Ray, I mean, one of the things, that, and I write about it in the book, and it's been a growing, I'm still growing, still trying to grow in this, but it was a profound growing for me, edge for me. Um, Howard Thurman once said, always look to the growing edge. <laughs> always look to the growing edge. And um, was how on the one hand, to um, have the integrity of having convictions about things and yet having the humility to know that you aren't God and that you trust you are right, but you aren't God and having the humility, having integrity and the humility before your brother, your sister, your sibling who may hold a different position. And, and, and that, I mean, I characterized it as learning how to stand and kneel at the same time. And, and part of what that takes is I've got to kneel before you, if you will, because you are created in the image of God. I believe that. And that there is something of God that dwells deep within you. And I suspect it's the capacity to love, but that's a whole nother discussion. But there's something about God, you know, that, 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 you know, the old saying, apple doesn't fall far from the tree, where there's something, you know what I mean, at the apple um, in you, about you, that, that hasn't fallen far from the tree that is God, if you will. Um, and I have to kneel before that because you are of infinite worth and value. Dr. King said, of infinite metaphysical value. Um, I believe that to be true, and I must kneel before that image of God in you. Um, and yet, at the same time, I must stand for a conviction, a belief, um, for what I stand for. And somehow I've got to do both postures at the same time. If I'm doing both at the same time, then I can't demonize you. I may disagree with you, but I cannot demonize you. I cannot dehumanize you, even though I disagree with you. Now, imagine a context where we both are learning how to kneel and stand at the same time. You see, we have created just in that interchange, that's where love has created a space for both of us to dwell, even in profound disagreements. Now, I, I'm, I know that may sound like, wow, that sounds like a wonderful utopian vision. Let me tell you something. It's actually part of what democracy is about. The capacity, oh, absolutely. it really is. Um, so this is no more a dream than the American dream. E pluribus unum, that it is possible to create government of the people, by the people, and for the people, knowing full well the people are going to disagree. <laughs> but I'm glad you cited in the book the excellent work of journalist Jim Bishop, 
yes. who in his book, The Big Sort, explains how over time we have um, retreated to our neutral corners. We don't have to spend time in each other's faces anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have to spend time in each other's communities anymore because we've separated quietly and without much fanfare, separated ourselves. If you are a Republican, you are more likely to live in a community full of Republicans. If you are a Democrat, you are more likely to live in a community full of Democrats. And it goes through the various proclaimed identities, not mm -hmm. just party affiliation. You're more likely to live with people like you than in the more haphazard, more organic communities that we had uh, before that weren't quite so sorted. Thank God. I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, a very diverse, crowded, interesting, yeasty place. And I never would have known a lot of the people I grew up with and had to deal with. I mean, I yeah. had to learn how to deal. I had no choice. Uh, and that was a gift to me, but it's a gift that maybe teenagers today are not having because they tend to grow up in economically uh, and, and in other identities, more homogeneous places. It's tougher, isn't it, to it is pull tough. off the work that you've been talking about, to find a vessel that'll hold us all, to find um, an arena where we all stand together mm -hmm. uh, than it was when you and I were coming up. You're absolutely right, Ray. And I, I'm convinced that that is, that, that may be, that may be one of the profound works that we who are church, um, but not just we who are church, we who are people of faith. Um, this may be one of our profound works in this time um, that we have to do. And we, and, and the thing is, um, I, you know, one of the things I learned from Bishop Chip, the late Bishop Chip Marble, who is the Bishop of Mississippi and a, and a real mover in Mississippi, um, who, who just did some remarkable things around race, around LGBTQ folk, um, in Mississippi as the Bishop of Mississippi. And one of the things I learned when he retired and came in and helped me out in North Carolina when I was Bishop there, Chip used to always say progress never happens um, by accident. It happens um, because of somebody who intentionally sought and worked until something happened. Um, Dr. King said that progress never happens on wheels of inevitability. It takes people working hard and praying and working. And, and, and like that parable Jesus told about that woman who uh, kept going to the judge and he wouldn't listen to her. She kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back like Winston Churchill. She didn't quit. She would not quit. Um, that's the kind of um, work and effort and prayer that it takes to change anything because I mean, change is hard for a variety of reasons. One, because you get, I mean, I know in my own life, the older I get, the more comfortable I am with things um, just kind of being the way they are. Um, I mean, and we've all gone through this experience of this pandemic. I mean, I found myself looking back at January like it was the golden age. <laughs> what a January, you know? Um, but, but there is that pining for the way things were, the way things are. Um, that's that's human. So to change, even for the good, um, takes extra work. I had a consultant uh, one to a dear woman named Susie Miller, who was just extraordinary. She was she was a consultant for me when I was a new bishop, an executive coach kind of. But she was also a spiritual director, and and she used to say what consultants often say: um, many systems do not change until the pain of remaining the same is perceived as greater than the pain of the change. Then the change happens. Um, the Montgomery bus boycott succeeded because of the boycott, but it also succeeded because the boycott inflicted enough pain on the economic realities and businesses across the nation began to say, this is not good for business. The pain of remaining the same was perceived as greater than the pain of the change to desegregate and maybe to even integrate. That's true in social systems. It's true in human systems, human families. It's true in individual lives, which is one of the reasons change is always uh, difficult, even if it's for the good. In diplomacy, you'll often hear references to something called proximity talks. And the idea is that um, in proximity, you are forced to encounter each other, forced to encounter each other's demands, 
forced to live in each other's presence in a way that eventually gives way to compromise, mm -hmm. to discussion about what's really hard. And proximity talks are hard. Yeah. And I wonder if we are living at a time where it's too easy to walk away from each other. Yeah. I was the, an invited speaker in the Lenten series when the Diocese of Fort Worth was going through its terrible times. Mm -hmm. And um, the new bishop asked me to come down and, and speak to the still in the Episcopal Church people mm -hmm. of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And we met where? In a high school gymnasium. <laughs> and we had Eucharist and uh, I, I gave a talk and those people were in full on mourning, not just for the physical comforts of the pews and the columbariums where their parents were buried and the altar and uh, that they were married at and the font where their children were baptized. They were in mourning for a kind of painful divorce that they were going through with people who they still loved and people who they missed. And I thought, gee, you know, that was when I was thinking about proximity talks. They, mm. if you are forced to be in each other's faces, yeah. you're forced to work it out. But we have created a world in so many ways where you can just bail. You, yeah. you finally can say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm done yeah. and you'll leave. And America's a big place and yeah. we can relocate inside it in a lot of ways and not have to see our brother and our sister who we have a grievance with. And um, what the Episcopal Church has experienced writ small, a lot of hard feelings and a lot of walking away and a lot of sad partings, uh, maybe our country is going through right now at the same time. And because we can't have proximity talks, right. uh, we're not forced to work it out. Right, right. Well, and I, and I and I think I think you you put your finger on something and 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 Bishop's uh, a book, uh, the Big Sword, um, emphasizes that that this kind of segregation. I use the word segregation. It's a resegregation of America. This kind of segregate segre, segregation separation um, creates its own host of. Uh, complexities and demonic realities that that just proximity can help to mitigate. It doesn't eliminate them, but it helps to mitigate. Um, and you know, there's this old, you um, uh, I mean, uh, I, there are theologians listening to this, but I'm going to quote him anyway. But Paul Tillich said, the essence of sin is separation. Uh, separation from God, but separation from each other. And I think he was on to something. Um, actually, the prophet Isaiah said something about the gap, the gulf the gap, um, uh, the chasm. Um, there is something insidious about separation from God and each other. And, and the wider the separation, the more demonic and crazy stuff can get in the gap. Um, it can mind, it, it will mind the gap instead of love minding the gap. Um, and we're seeing that in American society. Um, and, you know, I mean, we all watched the election last week um, and you saw the people at the boards, those electronic boards, and there were some red areas and some blue areas, and then a couple of purple areas or striped or something. Um, th they could measure ahead of time. I mean, this is what Bishop said in the book. The marketers know this. They know what stores to put near what neighborhoods and that kind of thing. Every politician knows which areas um, are, are red areas, which are blue, which are purple, which are mixed, which are whatever. I mean, they know it, it's we America. I mean, it is almost as though somebody went to the cemetery and, and, and dug Jim Crow up and said, Jim Crow, we got a new idea. They may not fall for the racial one. That's too frontal assault. Oh, we get Some of them will fall for it, but most folk won't fall for that. Here's what we'll do. We'll separate them by like mindedness. Who can disagree with that? You can't even come up with a law to stop that. Let's segregate them by political party and by like-mindedness and ideological. And let's separate, segregate them by social economic class and all of that kind of stuff. They'll never know what hit them. And we'll accomplish what we tried to do in Jim Crow segregation. Only this time, 
they won't be able to come up with a civil rights act to stop it. That's what's going on in American society. And Bishop was right on target. And we've got to find ways. Okay, we can't change all the housing patterns completely, although there are some public policy things that can help to do that. Um, but what we can do is create other spaces where people come together across differences. And as Chip Marble taught me, it has to be done intentionally. I think we who are the church have the capacity and the calling and other peoples of faith and peoples of goodwill. Um, Braver Angels isn't a religious group. It has some religious folk in it, it has secular folk in it. I mean, it's people who are concerned about the democracy of this country um, who have come together to do it. So I think there are people of goodwill. There's the possibility of getting a movement going that actually could affect this country for the good. Do we speak with a big enough voice in the culture in 2020 to be in the vanguard. I mean, we're a small people inside a really big people. Mm -hmm. um, can we uh, punch above our weight in this regard? Um, not only modeling a version of that co future community you're talking about, but talking about what's good about it to the wider America. I think we can can do it to some extent. I mean, in a little way, I wrote this book to punch above our weight to some extent, because part of what I've, I've, I'm very aware of, I mean, this book is, is an act of evangelism for me. I mean, it really is. It's actually a, a way of saying this is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is actually about, not what is sometimes popularly understood in our culture. Um, that it is about a way of love that can transform individual lives, social lives, and a universe, a global life. It is about a way of love, a way of life that actually makes a difference and can make a difference, but it's hard work to get there. It can be done though. I think we as a church can punch above our weight, but not just on our own by doing this work ourselves, but by inviting others um, to join us in this work, to join in this work ecumenically, interfaith, um, and and when I say interfaith, I mean not just religious faith, but but non-sectarian um, uh, other people in this country. I think I, that's one of the reasons I've been encouraging Braver Angels and all that kind of stuff. Um, things like our civil discourse kind of program that the Office of Government Relations does here um, as part of the encouraging that I've been offering those resources wherever I go. I think we can, but we got to join coalitions. We got to join hands and hands and build bigger networks uh, because I think there are, there's a critical mass of people concerned about the destiny of our democracy, not simply because of the recent election, but because of the polarization and the divisions that are not just matters of disagreement, but have actually gone deeper than that. And that we know we've got to heal our land. Do we, as a first, step as a predicate to doing this, uh, have to revive a more thorough conversation about what love means. Uh, not top 40 love, well, not necessarily, uh, but uh, love in all its dimensions mm -hmm. so that we can reclaim that idea that we don't have to be gazing dreamily into each other's eyes 24 hours a day, uh, that we don't have to agree with each other all the time. We don't have to uh, just wanna, wanna just give everybody a hug. There's a kind of love, an adult, fully present, fully fleshed love that is part of the work of being alive yeah. that has nothing to do with romantic love, that has nothing to do even sometimes with affection. I, I, as I read the book, it gave, it walked us through some of those steps, but you've got to do it for our audience right now. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've, I mean, the, the, and, you know, I know that I'm speaking to a seminary community, so I don't want to get too far above my pay grade, but, 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 you know, the English language is a wonderful language. I mean, Shakespeare and Shelley and Keats and Langston Hughes and uh, Maya Angelou, I mean, they're, they're wonder, wonders in English language. And yet there are some limitations to English. Uh, one of them is we only have one word for love. Um, we, we can't nuance, uh, we just can't, we don't have the nuances of different words for love and other languages do. 
um, um, the Greek language of, of Koine Greek of the New Testament did. Um, so that, um, you know, the word eros uh, is more the romantic kind of love. Um, and so when you see eros in the Bible, um, you know, Song of Solomon, a Greek translation of Song of Solomon or something like that, um, that's romantic love, makes sense. Philia, uh, uh, fraternal love. Um, you know, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, you think about, and then then um, agape, um, kind of the unselfish, sacrificial love that, um, that's what I'm really talking about most of the time, that actually seeks the good and the welfare of others above, um, uh, including oneself, but not just about oneself. Um, that That's the love. Now, when John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, is that eros? I mean, is that God having erotic impulses about the word? I don't think so. You see what I'm saying? But we only have the same word love to translate there in that one spot. But it's talking about God so loved the world, not that he took, but that he gave. There's a definition of the kind of love that's, that dominates the New Testament, that dominates on the lips of Jesus. A love that, that, that gives, a love that seeks the good, the welfare and the well-being of others as well. That's the kind of love. It's Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Ethics, which which I it's amazing because it's, he never finished the book um, because he got killed, arrested, and killed by the Nazis. Um, but but he um, he didn't finish the book with a pen. He finished it with his life. Um, and in one of the chapters in that book, he says biblical love or love typically in the New Testament, not always, but typically in the New Testament is cruciform. It is shaped like the cross, self-sacrificing for the good and the well-being of others. That that, I mean, Jesus, the man for others, I think it was Bonhoeffer who said that. That is the nature of the kind of love that I'm talking about primarily. That is not simply a sentiment. It is a commitment, a commitment to live life a certain way, unselfish, sacrificial. And that kind of love, that's what Dr. King was talking about. That's what... Um, that's the kind of love that can actually re-knit a fragmented society back together. Um, and that, that kind of love is a game changer. Um, it was in the first century and it is in the 21st century. Um, and so that's what, what I do find interesting, you know, uh, and I, I talk about it in the book is, is you know, for years I've, I've, I've read First Corinthians, Corinthians 13, um, you know, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Um, now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that or read that at, at weddings. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the top 10 of the hit parade at weddings, no question about it. But um, what's amazing to me, and I knew this from seminary, I remember doing an exegesis class in 1 Corinthians, um, but, but I had forgotten about it, I think, after all those years of pastoral ministry. It finally dawned on me a few years ago, wait a minute, Paul didn't write that for a wedding. It applies to marriages. <laughs> it applies to relationships. Paul wrote that to probably one of the church's most dysfunctional congregations in the history of Christendom, the Church of Corinth. It was a mess. People were divided into factions. People were dividing up as to who baptized who. And, and I love that line where Paul says, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that you all are dividing yourselves up into factions. I love to say every church I've ever pastored has a Chloe in it. Somebody who knows everybody else's business. This church was dividing itself up into factions. Folk were lying on each other, suing each other. Rich folk got their communion first. The poor folk got theirs later. Some folks said, I got the Holy Ghost and you don't. Some folks said, I'm going to heaven and you're not. I mean, this was a church that was tearing itself apart by unenlightened, what's John Stuart Mill called? Unenlightened self-interest, selfishness was destroying it. And Paul says, no, I will show you a still more excellent way. Though you speak with the tongues of men and of angels, you can sound all religious all day long. If you have not love, you are a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. You are a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Um, you are just making noise. Love is not jealous. Love is not rude. Love does not insist. You see what's going on there? He is de um, deconstructing the destruction of selfishness destroying community and reconstructing it and showing the way to a new creation, to be born again, to learn how to live together as brothers, sisters, siblings, as the children of God. That's the genius 
of 1 Corinthians 13. And that is the genius of love. That's what Jesus, I'm, Jesus figured it out. The brother had it right. Well, I'm wondering then if part of the reconstruction, part of the rehab, if you will, hmm. the word love that we've got in the English language, we just got it, we got to use it. <laughs> yeah. Whether it would help if the kind of thing you were talking about was not only coming from the mouths of preachers. Yes. Not only coming from people with collars or preacher tabs, but were coming from leaders in other contexts mm -hmm. who were ready, because it think about it, it would sound a little soft-headed and a little odd for the mayor to be talking about love. Yeah. Um, it would sound unusual for the governor to be talking about love or the county commissioner. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be but it right. would be. Right, and, you wouldn't expect it. <laughs> right, and, and in that wider multifaceted idea of love, um, it might be useful, especially at a very, very secular time, mm. to hear about love yeah. in all its dimensions yeah. from other people of authority in the society besides just preachers of the word and the various words that there are. I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm one of the preachers, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> right. <with you. laughs> but you know, what's interesting is, uh, it was, it was interesting to watch the demonstrations, the protests this summer. I heard the word love over and over again. Most of the protesters, um, very few of them were violent or causing trouble. Those are extremists. Um, but the, 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 the protesters were, they were our children, <laughs> our young people. They were asking, I mean, they, you saw the word love on the placards, on their signs over and over again. In secular culture, there's more, more music that's moved beyond just romantic notions of love. You know, I mean, that's still there, of course. To, to talking about, I mean, Stevie Wonder was doing, I mean, Marvin, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Marvin Gaye was talking about, I and mean, there, there's been a drumbeat of love trying to emerge in secular culture. Um, that hasn't always filtered up to, you know, I suppose it's sort of tough for politicians to talk about love. Um, again, because we only got one word. I think, I think there's some of that. There's some difficulty. When I, I, was, uh, I was interviewed by the Harvard Business uh, Review uh, two years ago or so, and, and um, at one point the interviewer said, look, this, this, the language of love isn't um, one that communicates or that's often heard in the corporate world where most of our readers live. Uh, can you translate it? I said, yeah. Um, it's the difference between living just for me and living for we. We includes me, but me doesn't necessarily include you. <laughs> and therefore, if love is about living for we, that includes me. Um, what the South African tradition calls Ubuntu. Um, I am because we are. Um, and, and that, if we begin, sometimes we may have to reframe it in language that, 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 that other folk can use. Um, somehow, at some point, our political leaders are going to have to invite us to love each other in America. It's going to take that. It's going to take that. We're going to have to claim this, that we're going to love each other. Now, it's bigger than loving each other just because we're Americans. We're human. But, but let's start somewhere. Start, call, claim, the, you know, let that hymn come labor on that says, claim the high calling angels cannot share. Sometimes we got to claim the high calling. Um, and we need our leaders, our political leaders, to claim that high calling, to, 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 like the psalmist says, set me on a rock that is higher than I, to set us up on a rock that is higher, not to let us dwell in the gutter and in the muck and the mud, uh, to set me on a rock that is higher than I. Show me the better angels of my nature. Show me um, and, and invite me to be better than I would be on my selfish self. That... I mean, that, that, they can call us that, to that. Um, we need our leaders to call to that. Um, and there are some, I mean, there are some, um, and, and, and there are some in the, in the corporate world. There are, um, uh, there really are, there are, you know what, there's more good out there. There's more virtuous out there than we often know. 
it's just that the sound of, remember when you were a kid and you were on the playground and everybody was playing over on one side and playing football. And then if a fight broke out somewhere on the other side of the playground and somebody hollered, fight, fight, everybody ran over to where the fight was. Um, that's how we human beings are like that. I have no idea why, but we're kind of like that. And, and yet the truth is, most of the time, most folk aren't fighting. Right. Most folk are decent people. Are, are, want to live decent lives. Want to be kind. Um, most people reflect that image that God put in us. Most of us do. But the reality, I know the reality of sin and the reality of selfishness, it's there. It's always there. But good is greater than that. I refuse to believe that the selfish, the sinful, the evil is going to win. God is God. As long as God is God, good is going to win. Love is going to have the last word. If you've been listening to our conversation and kind of itching to join it, you can use the Q&A function down there at the bottom, enter a question, and uh, we'll see if I can get to it. Greg asks, Bishop Curry, there are contemporary communities of persons who have embodied the kneeling and standing. Are there contemporary communities or persons who've embodied the kneeling and standing of which you speak? John Lewis comes to mind. Are there others? Uh, there are others. Um, I mean, I've mentioned braving, braving, braver angels, but there are other communities locally that I'm aware of. Um, I'm sure that there are more nationally. I know that there are people doing this because I've seen some of them. I've seen it in the church. I mean, I've actually seen it in the church. Um, as, as much difficulty as we've had, and we've had difficulty in our church around um, issues of sexuality, human sexuality and all of that. And yet I've also seen, and I saw it as a bishop of a diocese, I have seen moments and times when people have knelt and stood at the same time. I, I've seen them do it, um, which tells me the capacity is there. Um, and, and it's happening. It's, it's happening around. I think we have to intentionally work at making this, this happen. I think we do. What I've described is basically um, what's often called nonviolent communication, nonviolent living. Um, that that um, um, I was just doing a, a video that earlier this morning for the border um, bishops conference coming up the end of this month, I think. Um, on the border. And um, this time they're focusing on global peacemaking, um, um, uh, you know, to, to be peacemakers and actually doing some of the practices and some of the trainings that help give people tools for actually living a life that is a peacemaking one um, that actually does make for real and genuine peace, not, not peace at any price, but genuine peace. Um, there's, anyway. Maggie asks, if pain is such a great instigator for change, then how can love be as effective? Well, I think in the long run, uh, while pain may precipitate an awareness of the need for change, and, and sometimes, I mean, Mahatma Gandhi um, recognized, uh, Dr. King followed his example, that sometimes you, you, when negotiations break down and when there's not a way of agreed upon change, um, that it's necessary to precipitate a crisis. That's what a nonviolent campaign, whether it's a boycott, whether it's a strike or whatever it is, it is designed to precipitate a crisis um, that is designed to do a couple of things. Not that the crisis isn't intended to hurt someone. The crisis is intended, I think Gandhi said, to prick the conscience, to prick the conscience of good people to see, wait a minute, something's wrong. We weren't paying attention before. Um, when, when the American people saw Bull Connor, sick German shepherd dogs on teenagers um, in Birmingham in 1963, folks said, there's something wrong with this. Um, when America saw George Floyd choked to death by, on that cell phone of that 17 year old girl, most people said, there's something wrong with this. You see what I'm saying? Now, nobody wanted anybody to have to die, but there is something about that conflict that, pr that pricks the conscience enough to awaken it. And an awakened con conscience is gonna want to respond by positive action that tries to remediate whatever it was that was wrong. Now, where the love comes in as a necessity, the process for one pricking the conscience must be bathed in love, unselfish love that is not about hurting or harming, but is about changing the heart. Um, 
and it must be um, followed by a commitment to a loving way that creates a future for both those who have been put down and maybe those who have benefited from putting others down. That the, the heart uh, at, the, at the heart of slave and slave master must be touched. The hearts of oppressed and oppressor must be touched. Otherwise you degenerate into a bloodbath, a civil war bloodbath and nobody wins. It's either, that Dr. King said it well, we either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. Love, a commitment to the way of love is a way of making sure that our actions don't degenerate under the rubric of justice into revenge. We got several questions about the ideological narrowing of the Episcopal Church. Lorna asks, I'm concerned that the loss of our more conservative brothers and sisters that happened in 2003 has crippled us in our attempts to engage those who think differently about issues. What do you think? Well, I think there was some of that, but I can, I can honestly say that my experience of the church is that we are profoundly more diverse um, and I don't mean just in terms of ethnic or ethnicity or that kind of thing, in terms of theological and political opinions and understandings. Um, I know that as Bishop of North Carolina, that was the case. I mean, believe me, I mean, uh, wherever there are two or three Episcopalians, there's always a third opinion. I mean, it's just sort of a given. And that actually is true. There's more um, diversity among us that I've experienced. I mean, I actually experiencing it. Um, in terms of our views and understandings um, that, than you would expect. You would assume it's the Episcopal Church is just a liberal denomination. My experience is it's much more varied than that, especially when you travel around the country, when you move off the coast, um, when you actually experience the Episcopal Church um, in all of its breadth, you'll discover there actually is a wondrous diversity of thought um, and of perspective um, that I think is good. Now we've got more work to do, but I think, I still think that that is, um, I think it's good. And in the long run, we need to be a church that is truly Catholic, truly universal. And that's not just ethnically diversity, or, uh, but, but that's also political diversity and, and even theological diversity. Um, I think that's critically important. One way that we don't match the changing America is in our racial makeup. The church is about 90% white, which you can probably pull off in a country that's still about two thirds white or so. Mm -hmm. But in 25 years, the country will be half non-white and it's tougher to be a church that's 90% white in a right. country that's 50% white. Can we pull it off? Do we even want to? Right. No, I think the Episcopal Church must mirror the, fla the face of America. It, it, it should reflect, I used to say it in North Carolina, I said, you know, I pray for the day when we in the Diocese of North Carolina will look like North Carolina in all of its wondrous and beautiful diversity and human tapestry. That that's, that's the church Catholic. Um, that's, that's the church universal. Um, and that, that's my vision and prayer for us, but it will take a while to get there. It's gonna take a while for that, that, but it could happen. It could happen. And there's some seeds happening even now, even now. There are some happening in local communities in small ways um, where we're seeing real multiracial congregations um, emerging, um, younger congregations. I mean, it's actually happening, but it's slow because you're going against cultural trends, housing patterns, um, cultural, I mean, there's a lot going on, but. There's some people working at it, like Chip Marble told me, with intentionality. So we're still going to be here in 2050. Who? The Episcopal Church? Yeah, we're going to be different. We're going to be profoundly different. Um, that's why I keep telling folks, everybody wants to get upset about the parochial report. I don't get upset about parochial statistics. That's worrying about the institutional framework. Um, I know for a fact that the Jesus movement that has become the Episcopal Church, that's going to continue, but it's going to be reformed in new ways. It's going to be remade, and it's going, and it's going to look different. In 50 years, I mean, I won't be here to see it, but it's going to look different. Um, 
um, we're going to be a lot of house churches, a lot of small intentional communities, a lot of small communities. There'll still be some big places and all that, but it's going to be, it's going to diversify even in its structure and organization. And the church is going to live, trust me, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the truth is, the Jesus movement has existed when the church was established and when the church was disestablished, when it was a sectarian underground movement and when it was the official religion of the Roman Empire. This church has survived uh, underground and above ground. And believe me, it can re it reconfigures the spirit will lead us. And oh, yeah, we're not going anywhere. We're just going to change. Well when uh, someone like me is invited to do a job like this, I really only have two responsibilities. One is to run a good conversation, and Bishop Curry makes that easy. The other one is to get off on time, and yes. I'm going to do that too, and You're turn great. it over to Ian Markham. Great to see you, Bishop. Ray, thank you for everything. Thank you for doing this, brother. Can I just say that was uh, an absolute extraordinary exchange we've just witnessed. There are many things I love about listening to Bishop Curry, and one of them is the way in which he sort of navigates from John Stuart Mill to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And when you read the book, let me just stress, his grandmother is a oh, yes. prominent interlocutor uh, for framing his thoughts and worldview. That was a, a sheer joy, the, the penetrating questions and the depth of the analysis. I want to thank you both. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Bishop Curry. To all of you who are tuning in, and for those of you who ask questions, thank you very much for doing so. We're conscious we didn't get to them all, but that's a sign of a program uh, that was uh, worthwhile and valuable and precious. Let me remind you once again, this is a book launch. So if you're not yet brought Love is the Way, please do purchase it. I really do recommend it and every good library should have a copy. As we end, let me remind you that the next Centre for Anglican Communion Studies webinar will be on Wednesday, November the 18th at five o'clock Eastern Standard Time. The subject will be Indigenous Voices, Justice and Our Land. And our guest will be the Reverend Katenya Aryu Ira, Principal of St. John's Theological College in Auckland, New Zealand, and Bishop Carol Gallagher, Canon for the Central Region of the Diocese of Massachusetts. Join us for what promises to be another insightful and exciting conversation. Thank you, everyone, and may God bless us all.